determination of this very special artistic genre, which has shaped the urban uh, landscape in Jeru of Jerusalem and contributed to its unique uh, combination of the ceramics and Jerusalem stone, both of which have become um, characteristics and, um, and familiar um, aspects of Jerusalem. Um, to, your, to those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, Yad Yitzhak Ben Zvi, I'd like to give you a few words of introduction. Yad Ben Zvi was uh, established in 1969 and it is dedicated to research and education in a few different uh, areas. One is the history of the land of Israel. Another, another area of interest for us is um, Jewish communities in the East and Yad Ben Zvi has two research institutes which are dedicated to these two um, areas. Of course, we also have the School for Jerusalem Studies, which is well known in Jerusalem and in Israel for tours in Jerusalem and all over the, all over the country. Um, and um, we also have a bookshop in Yad Ben Svi. I'd like to mention that there's a sale going on now until the 20th of May. Um, and especially of interest for all those participating in this meeting is the book published by Yad Ben Svi about Armenian ceramics of Jerusalem which at the moment can be uh, purchased for a very good price of 75 shekels, including shipping. Um, at the moment, as you know, due to COVID-19 uh, limitations, we are unable to carry out tours in Jerusalem. Uh, we rarely hope that we will be able to renew our, tours, our tours, uh soon. Um, and hopefully the Rockefeller Museum, which is showing the Glimpse of Paradise exhibition, will also be able to um, to open soon. I'd like to mention that in spite of the limitations of COVID-19, next Thursday and Friday on the 21st and 22nd of May, we will be holding uh, special tours for Yom Yerushalayim for Jerusalem Day. Um, and you're obviously very um, welcome to join us. Of course, again, this is um, dependent on any developments in the Ministry of Health uh, guidelines. Um, in the um, meeting today, we will be taking a tour with Nishan Balian, uh, the, um, an artist um, in, the, um, in the Armenian ceramics of Jerusalem. We will also be visiting with Charlotte and John Stores. We will be hosted by Elena Dubinsky of the Ceramic and Glass Department from Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design. And another co-host is Dr. Nirit Shalev Khalifa of Yad Ben Svi. Please, one very important um, point is that um, Whoever's registered to this meeting can join in our tours in Rockefeller Museum. And if you have not registered, please write your details in the chat um, on the side of the screen and we will contact you with information um, about this specific topic and this tour as well as other things that might interest you that are um, led by Yad Ben Smith. I'd like to um, turn the meeting over to Dr. Miri Chalev Khalifa, who will take you down the trail of the blue tiles. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. I think uh, we have uh, many guests in uh, England also, and uh, we are all here with uh, still uh, the Corona days. Uh, I know that uh, uh, in England you are still in, in process. Uh, we are here start feeling more and more uh, free in the last few days. Uh, but we're still keeping uh, like uh, Nishan Balian sitting uh, beside me and he's keeping the distance. So uh, that's, uh, that, that's the reason that he's sitting uh, behind me. We are here in uh, Nablus Road in uh, Jerusalem uh, in uh, the Balian uh, uh, studio. And uh, I think that people that uh, join us uh, two weeks ago, when we uh, visited the, the Karakashian family, uh, we uh, recognized uh, this building of uh, the joint uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and now we are going uh, to make the story more and more uh, deeper. And you'll see in all our meeting, and this is the second uh, and not the last one for sure, uh, that we are going to use uh, the opportunity that the Zoom gave us uh, to meet also uh, the people who were part of this history of this uh, unique uh, art school of the Armenian ceramic of Jerusalem, 
hundred years ago and we are going to uh, meet and to speak with the Storz family in Oxford and um, uh, uh, we are going to go hundred years uh, uh, ago when uh, those families uh, met and were uh, um, part of making the new Jerusalem because after the first world war Jerusalem uh, was uh, in the beginning of new era new rulers the British but the first time they came with a conception that uh, this is not uh, you know when someone uh, comes to Jerusalem during all the history uh, they said uh, everything that was before was a mistake and after me nothing will be because I'm here forever because God sent me. Jerusalem showed everyone that forever is uh, something that you have to be careful with but the British rulers, uh, General Allenby, when he stood at the entrance of the citadel at uh, uh, December 11, 1917, he uh, gave the proclamation that was the first time I think that the Jerusalem stones heard this, those things that uh, we got Jerusalem as a deposit. It's belong to all the three religions and from we are asking you the people of Jerusalem to keep your heritage and to keep your city and to keep the sites and conservation which was a term that in Europe start talking about it in the end of 19th century, but here in the Middle East, it was quite new. And the person that actually led this uh, uh, conception of conservation and create, you know, everyone thinks that uh, the two materials are important and, and they are symbolized Jerusalem. You say Jerusalem, you say the Jerusalem stone, you say Jerusalem, you say the Armenian ceramic of Jerusalem. And the stone was here, but uh, the fact that Sir Ronald Storrs, the first governor of Jerusalem, he came uh, to the city with ideas how the city should be looks like in the new era, how to preserve the ancient site, the tradition, and uh, he uh, established the Pro-Jerusalem Society and the Pro-Jerusalem Society uh, that were a partnership, the, maybe the first, and I don't remember it was since then, uh, uh, we hope it will be, uh, for uh, uh, the Pro-Jerusalem Society was a place that the Jewish, the Muslims and the Christians communities of Jerusalem gather together, usually they are against each other, and at, for, in the pro-Jerusalem society, they gather together for the sake of Jerusalem, for the beauty of Jerusalem. And uh, for example, uh, Ronald Storrs uh, said that uh, uh, it's not that you should build in Jerusalem only by stone, but all the other new materials are forbidden. And the other thing with a, 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 a other a friends of him a, in the beginning, it was a, also a Sir Mark Sykes, but a Aaron Stritchmond, a, the architect, and a, a, of course a, a Ashby from the Arts and Crafts Movement. A, and they gather all together and they brought a, the old a, tradition a, of craft in Jerusalem. There was one mistake and one good mistake in history. The glazed ceramic was not part of it. It was not part of it at all. It was not local uh, ceramic. And um, by uh, mistake, they thought that will be the reason to, to uh, make the, the glazed ceramic. And because of the Armenian genocide, that uh, many artists were refugees. They uh, brought to Jerusalem uh, Davido Anesian, who was very famous in Putachia, and then Davido Anesian found uh, more artists, families that he knew from Putachia, the Karakashian family, we spoke about them in the last meeting, and the Balian family. And from now on, we will hear the another chapter of uh, uh, this story.
but we'll start with a film that will take us with uh, Nishan. And the beginning is, of course, you can see what uh, the vision of Ronald Storrs was about Jerusalem. And uh, then Nishan will lead us uh, uh, in uh, the Zoom in the streets of Jerusalem. So please, we will see uh, the film. This is the entrance to the St. Saviour Church and also cemetery where all the Armenians are buried in from Jerusalem. Uh, we're entering now the main entrance and then now this is the courtyard where the patriarchs, the tomb of the patriarchs, the patriarchs of the Armenian church are buried. We can see the Ohannesian church altar, the Balian Karakashian with the crosses, uh, this is in front of the tombs of each patriarch, tourists sitting around and then you have on the floor the, uh, that's where the archbishops are buried. And we can see the top of the church. Again the Anesian uh, altar with missing tiles where this is an older film I did some of the renovation of those missing tiles. We're coming back uh, close up to the cross of the Balian Karakashian uh, murals. You can see the bullet holes from the 1948 and 67 wars. Now we're coming to the YMCA, to the main entrance of the YMCA in West Jerusalem, where my mother Marie and uh, father Setrak Balian did the uh, signage, the main signage at the entrance. The pattern was designed by my mother. And the calligraphy was done by my father, who was also, apart from being a, a famous master uh, potter on the wheels, he was also a nice calligrapher. That he did the Hebrew, Arabic, and English calligraphy. We're moving to the St. James Cathedral. That's the entrance. At the entrance, the main entrance of the cathedral, there are uh, two, three ceramic tile sections that. We're walking towards now, you'll see that's a close-up. That's what's painted by the joint workshop, we'll get back to that. Now we're entering the Betanasi, the gardens of the Betanasi with my mother and my father did some beautiful murals. This is in the garden, you can see the signature. 
Now this is inside at the Sukkot uh, uh, section of the Beit Anasi, the President's place. The, the motifs were designed by my mother with Jewish themes inside them. Uh, the elements of the barley, the lion, the palm tree, the dates. Uh, that was during the time of Mr. and Mrs. Herzog, President Herzog. Uh, she made a watercolor sketch and then they approved. And we went at that and did the murals, three main murals in the Sukkot house. As you can see, 84, signed 84. And whenever we get Armenian dignitaries from uh, Armenia uh, visiting, we are invited uh, to the Beit Anasi. Now we move on to the Malcha Mall. It's a, a very large mural that uh, my parents and my mother did during the time of Azrieli, who was the main contractor. Uh, again, a watercolor sketch, and then uh, she proposed that to Azrieli. Uh, and uh, he okayed that and went, we went ahead. But it's a pity it's placed in the Jerusalem Malcha in a very bad location. It's a beautiful mural. And then we're coming to the back to the Saint Saviour Church and to the tomb where my family is buried. Uh, my mother, Mary Balian, my father, my uncle, my grandfather, grandmother. This, uh, you're looking at a picture of the mural that my mom painted when my father passed away. The three gra grandchildren looking over there, me, myself, uh, my brother, my sister, and my mother crying. Uh, the Lord's Prayer on the top in Armenian. It's my mother crying for the death of my father. Uh, and basically, I'm just on the verge of renovating the tomb where my mother is buried too now and uh, I'm trying to do something nice in her memory also. thing happen in the world and so on and one try to do some the life is not like this the life is joy the life is to live your life very happily you know and I hope that it will bring you know happiness to the people all around here the, everybody said when they came oh who did this one who did this and they said Kavot. yes they said you see and uh, I am glad, I am glad that I did it. And it was an offer from us, you know, to give, you know, happiness to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem deserves it, you know, really. עכשיו חושפים את הציור הנפלא הזה, כל כך הרבה שמענו עליו. of paradise and okay we're back to after the gates of paradise uh, on Rehov Koresh we're back 
at St. James the Cathedral inside in front of the church. Uh, we see one of the last pieces that uh, my mother made. That was a few years back, that was her, one of her last pieces of the Madonna with Christ and then the tulips, carnations around the mural. This is actually her last piece as a mural which she gave as a gift to the church in memory of the Balian family. It's being copied left and right, but that is in 2012. And she passed away in 2017, so that was five years before she passed. Some of the pieces which uh, I made in the Armenian convent, uh, again with my mom's designs in memory of the Balian family, that's a fountain of youth, which was a design by my mother. It's a niche at the main entrance. That's a dedication tile for the Balian family. And then we go back to something uh, new, it's a mix of hand-painted and digital. This is a mural which I did in front of the, one of the patriarchs of the tombs. Again, we donated that in memory of the Balian family. It's a mix of digital and hand painting, it's a new technology. And it's taken from an old Armenian manuscript, the image. This is the entrance to the studio now, this is where the municipality uh, renovated the area, we donated the ceramic tiles. So that's the entrance, that's a nice seating area with the tree and with the Armenian ceramic sign. It's something which I did on porcelain tiles. That was a nice thing by the municipality, it was a nice gift to the Balian studio because it was a dump before, so it's much nicer this way. And that's the facade of the building with the old arches and that's the Palestinian pottery sign which we worked under until five years ago. And then I put, a, it's a mixture uh, coexisting together the Palestinian pottery name and the Armenian ceramics. And that's the book by Nurit. Uh, about the Armenian ceramics of Jerusalem, which was made by Yad Ben Tzvi and co-authored by Nirit also. A fantastic uh, book written about the Armenian ceramics history. A lot of my mother's ceramic tile murals, which we'll talk about later on. Can we hear you, Nishan? Can we hear you? We hear you. Can we hear you? Only read Nishan, Nishan, uh, Nishan doesn't have a, an audio connection. What, you don't have a connection? An audio connection. You can see. But we can't hear him. Yes. Okay. 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 Now, now we can hear you, Nishan? Yes. Okay. Everything okay? Okay. Yes. Basically, you, as a, you're in the Balian studio now, but it was also the Balian Karakashian the studio. Just a quick uh, pan around. These two rooms, it's where the Balian and Karakashian families used to live. The, the first room is where the Karakashian family lived, and the one further 
is where the Balian family used to live. There was a wall, there wasn't a door like that. So they used to amicably live together, uh, eat together, you know. Let's uh, walk to, these are the showrooms. Some of the ceramics that we do. In the showroom, self-portrait of my mother, Marie Balian. Uh, portrait of my late father, sitting by the fountain outside. Let's go outside. Okay, that's the main corridor. You'll see a lot of my mom's ceramic tile murals. Let me see, get the light correct. Most of these murals were exhibited at the Smithsonian in 1992. That's in Washington, DC, the famous Smithsonian uh, Museum. It was an achievement. It was the zenith of our achievements for a living artist. Some of the articles written about us, the media. So we start walking. Again, some again, my mother's murals. That was what was this? This is the style that basically she did uh, to really give authenticity to the Armenian ceramics of Jerusalem, uh, staying away from typical uh, symmetrical Turkish tulips or Islamic designs, uh, which we still do, and we, which we're famous for. But this is what she basically included, the animals, the peacocks, uh, the birds, all of these, that's her influence into the family. Now you see on the floor, before we enter to the museum, this is the family museum. On the floor, we have some kiln shelves. This, this used to be in the kiln, which we'll go inside and see the room of the kiln, which instead of destroying, throwing them away, I'm at this floor of the ceramic kiln shelves. We have a fountain over here. That was an order for a mosque for uh, Kuwait before 1967. Uh, the war happened, we couldn't send to Kuwait. So I made this fireplace, uh, the uh, fountain over here with the ceramic tiles which were uh, designated to a mosque in Kuwait. Now we go into the family museum. Okay, so I'll give the camera to somebody else. Yes, and now we are giving to Dina okay. Road from our chief uh, documentation uh, part. So this is to be the kiln room where, with bricks, there used to be a top clothing kiln that my grandfather built. And we used to go, you can see the bricks the, that I made a fireplace out of. I didn't throw those bricks, but my grandfather used to go from the top inside the kiln and put the ceramics in the shelves, close it with clay, and then fire it. Because first they started firing with wood firing, and then they did oil firing, and then eventually the kiln was crumbling. So we had to take it down with my late father, Sitrak Balian, and to uh, go to electric kilns, which you will see now. A lot of the stuff, uh, the ceramics that you see around here are uh, my collection and that I collect all over the world. A uh, large part was uh, given to me as a heritage to keep it in the museum. Uh, interesting pieces like... Yes, maybe uh, for our... Uh, like we used for to, our uh, guests uh, from England, yes. maybe many of them has uh, uh, some... Uh, yeah, there, a lot of the collection that I buy actually is from England. Right? eBay or auctions in England. And this is the, uh, the Palestine police map where during the mandate of Palestine it used to be Jewish, uh, uh, Muslim and Christian officers in the Palestine police. And that's one of the months. And we used to, at that time we used to sign Palestine then from 1922 until 1948. We used to sign Palestine underneath. And these are the two famous signatures of the Balian and the Karakashian families. The first initials uh, uh, of the Balian, this is the Balian, 
and the top is the Karakashan. That's K in Armenian uh, and that's B in Armenian. Okay. So. And some uh, more history in this uh, room. Yes. Uh, we have, maybe we'll go uh, for the to the 40s and yes. uh, all this political trouble in, in the. Again, beautiful pieces of uh, the joint uh, Bamiyan Karakashan workshop, which I think. Uh, in terms of design and uh, form, is second to none. Uh, really uh, spectacular. You can see the detail of the vases, the detail of the artwork which uh, Magardish Karakashan did, and some of the beautiful forms of the pottery which uh, my grandfather Nisham Balian did. An interesting piece over here is one of the Divisions of Palestine uh, on a ceramic tile, which I found about uh, a few pieces uh, about 20, 30 years ago, somewhere in the studio when I was cleaning the studio. Uh, one copy of it has, uh, Ehud Olmert uh, has one copy, and then uh, Ehud Barak, the Ship of Staff, has another uh, <laughs> copy of those tiles. Uh, in Arabic, in Islamic calligraphy, a beautiful Akhots Sharif. You know, uh, again, a joint workshop. You have over here the nativity scene in Armenian. You know, the, these are one, this is uh, one of three plates. I think the Karakashian family has another one. Pieces that I collect, like Ohanesian pottery, that, for this collection over here that you see, this collection, I actually, I sent my son, Sertak, who's in Armenia, uh, to get this collection from England, which I wanted an option. And um, Ishan, maybe about... Uh, uh, we have a can, thing, uh, thing uh, Hussein identify. on the top, if you can have the camera over there. Uh, that's King Hussein during his coronation. This is the broken one, but the uh, good one is the, uh, the Hashemite Palace. Hashemite Museum collection. Uh, a lot of interesting pieces. These used to be, again, the joint workshop of Balen Karakashian. They used to make these pieces that you see with lighter designs so that they could produce it cheaper, you know, just simple flowers and uh, sell it to other shops. We used to sell to export it to a guy in Tel Aviv and he used to export it to, to South Africa and other places. So we used to make it less dense so that to produce it cheaper. Um, some detailed work. You have over here the stamp made by the State of Israel commemorating the Armenian ceramics of Jerusalem, and that was in 2003 with the help of uh, Nurit and Nirit. Uh, it was the, it's the first time in the history of uh, uh, Israeli philately that you have. Uh, round stamps, uh, that's the first day edition the envelope. These are the round stamps, the first time in the history of Israeli philately that we have round stamps. And maybe I want, would like to point a few things. We even spoke uh, in the last meeting about uh, the two uh, patterns that became the symbol of actually the beginning of the unique art school, we are saying, but what is new? Of course, it came from the uh, 16th century and Tukatia, 18th century, where it was the first time that Armenian artists started doing this uh, glazed ceramic. But what happened in Jerusalem is to adopt the patterns that they found here in the ancient mosaic, in archaeology, in excavations, and in the uh, 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 1894 uh, 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 was found in an exhibition not far from here, a, a mosaic floor with the, what we call the bird's floor, uh, the, bird's, uh, the bird's mosaic, and the Armenian uh, potters by shape, and especially by the young family, was, uh, they were the potters, the, the, the pottery. And also, uh, uh, the first one, Alessia, who started with that, uh, found this uh, uh, Armenian ancient mosaic with an inscription described in the martyrs in the sixth century. And because they came from the genocide, they felt that they have to adopt 
the uh, birds in the zygote pattern. And you can see here, uh, we saw what the, uh, the painters, the Kampushian family, uh, did. We saw it in the last uh, uh, meeting, but now we can see how Mariba Lian uh, really the mosaic uh, floor, the beds, the beds mosaic to amazing uh, shapes and, and uh, images. And you can see many, many things that they are plates and jars and mm -hmm. uh, really a, a lot of things. The other thing that we uh, spoke about it is the Kirbet el Mahja, uh, again, the tree of life. Yes, the tree of life. Uh, and that was found in uh, this uh, uh, Muslim, early Muslim uh, uh, palace that was found near Jericho in, uh, in 1935 only. So they start, the Karakashian and the Balian uh, family start doing it, uh, this uh, uh, pattern. And Marie Balian even did something that was very dramatic. She said, uh, and you saw what she used to say, the life here are so difficult. So why do you keep the lion uh, in, in this uh, uh, painting? And uh, she uh, left her only the, the four exercises. Uh, so we can see how uh, Marie Balian uh, really developed all those ancient Christian symbols and I think one of the most uh, 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 important things that uh, happens here, and maybe Nishan will, will tell us about the peacock, that you call them the uh, Shabbat. Yes, I'll show the peacock and we'll go there. But meanwhile, I just want to show you some of the other pieces which I collect basically from the auctions. You can see a nice mug, again, the joint workshop, and then you have inside the mermaid. <laughs> uh, you know, that's uh, again, the signature of the joint workshop. And then some others have the fish inside, you know. So these are pieces that I collect. I haven't had the time to do uh, to, to them, to put them in order. Uh, regarding the uh, pig of patterns, actually we have a, we're going to have a look at the pig of patterns. It's very, it's before, very good that we before are we, Before we go to the peacock pattern, we go because I don't see it yes. over here. So yes. Let's go to the studio where we manufacture our product. And we are 100 people. Can you imagine? Yeah. You know, uh, so these are the, the, this is sort of a natural drying for the pieces which we manufacture. These are being dried and then they're going to be uh, sanded down to make them smooth. We produce these on our press. And we're coming to the throwing weed. This is what uh, I did uh, uh, a few days ago. I did some of the pieces, so I don't know if they're going to put the video. And these are the pieces, some of the pieces which are drying over here. Now, uh, my grandfather was a master potter. My father was a master potter also. He studied the British connection that we have is that he studied with Ray Finch in Winchcombe, at Winchcombe Pottery, and uh, also Bernard Leach. Some of your English potters should know, know these names. And then my son, Keam Balian, my eldest son, he went and did a few uh, courses, a few months uh, with uh, Ray Finch's son. So we kept the tradition mm -hmm. of continuing the British connection in terms of the pottery. Uh, let's go to the kilns. These are the kilns that we have. Again, electric kilns, which we moved away. This is from Germany. These are the older ones from uh, pot clays in England. It was a connection. Some tile production. These are defective tiles, which we uh, did for a project. The color didn't come out right. This was for a project in Qatar for a private villa. And then we go over, we have the time to show a simple uh, production process over here. Let's put the machine on. 
Okay. I just wanted to show you a simple process uh, of how we do the RAM test. I will do manufacture the same amount to use our, uh, our uh, balls, plates, and other items. That's called the RAM press. It was developed in uh, it was developed in the States. Uh, we have a machine over here. I'm just putting some salt over here as a lubricant. Let's see if this is going to work, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the machine has been dry for a while now. Okay. Let's see. So basically I'm putting a piece of clay inside. And now these are special high density gypsum uh, molds which we make. I'm closing the mold. Okay. Opening the mold. Now, putting pressure with my foot, cleaning the edges. And the mold has the tubing inside, so I'm putting pressure. And hopefully, we get the piece out. <laughs> Yeah, this is hopefully. <laughs> okay, I just forced myself in removing it, but usually you get a nice round ball, you know, mm -hmm. and we just put it over here, let it dry, and then once it's dry, we can sand it, we pattern it, we clean it and fire it for the first firing, which is a thousand degrees centigrade. So if you're going to put the video on now, yes, we will of uh, me doing some of the pottery. So they're going to connect now. Eli, you can show us the series, because we will see the clip now, okay? This is something that Nishan couldn't show us in, on live. <laughs> because you have to prepare for it. Are you on by sound? Yes, it's Okay, so basically I'm centering the clay as a lot of you potters know that. I'm not a great potter. I should practice more. I should practice on the larger pieces, but uh, it's not bad because I studied ceramic engineering as an engineering and not as an art form, you know, so. Let's see. Let me see what the so okay. So my grandfather used to do this, uh, and my father they used to do this very easily, and produce uh, hundreds the same size, the same, uh, that was the thing in ceramics, the ceramics, the key word is consistency. So you have to be able to uh, produce uh, 50 pieces, the same size, the same height, you know. Uh, consistency is the holy grail in ceramics. In glazes, in clay, you know, you have to do all of that. It has to be consistent or you get into a lot of problems during firing, after firing, before firing as a lot of, uh, as some of the potters who are watching this would know. So just making the form. This is an old uh, throwing wheel. We need some nice Armenian music in the background <laughs> with the flute. So that's it. And I'm just chopping it off and putting it aside. And then you saw some of the pieces which were drying. I 
I just couldn't do this live with the mess and then in the small amount of given time that we had. Okay. So, okay, just uh, mm -hmm. some other things. These are the street signs which we do with the municipality of Jerusalem. Uh, it's very interesting. We've redone all the uh, street signs uh, with porcelain tiles. The older ones used to crack due to the weather. And this is something uh, new. We have a digital system, which we're doing very well with. It's the only digital printing system in uh, Israel and Palestine. So we do a lot of work where people give us uh, the images and we do interpretive signs for exterior use. Nothing can uh, uh, harm these, uh, neither rain nor snow. Even uh, if you paint over it, it can be cleaned, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's the, let's go back to the studio inside. And maybe here, I am on the peacock pattern, the creation of my mother. She, and we have it over here in a better form. And she called it the Chagall Peacocks, basically because Chagall, Chagall visited, Mark Chagall, the famous artist, as you all of you know, he visited the studio with Teddy Kolek, and Teddy Kolek used to bring all the, his VIP guests uh, to our studio, and Chagall came and sat by the, where the girls used to paint, and my mother, because she was uh, French, uh, Armenian and from the Bazaar de Lyon, and she was ecstatic, Chagall uh, doing ceramic tiles in our studio. And in the middle of his painting of one single tile, uh, he, he stopped. Uh, apparently didn't know which color to put. So my mother says, uh, Matt, don't you think if you put brown, it will be better? And the whole entourage, you know, with Teddy Kolek and the press, they went quiet, you know, my mother telling uh, Chagall what color to put. And he looks at her and says, vous avez raison, madame. You have a uh, good reason, uh, madame, and puts brown over there. So uh, in memory of his visit, uh, she modified and did this uh, uh, peacock pattern and called it the Chagall peacocks. We have the Armenian mosaic pattern, which uh, you did was talking about. This is uh, the identity of Jerusalem, which uh, Ohanesian, uh, Balian Karakashian, the joint workshop, and uh, Karakashian alone, and Balian alone, they uh, do similar work. And that's about it. Okay. okay. Because we're in the same room, you have to close to mute. And, uh, okay. And uh, now we'll. Uh, Continue. I will uh, take the okay. And here we come. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's very fast. Uh, please, if you can turn it off. And uh, we are uh, me sitting in, in uh, Jerusalem and uh, Nabus Road, and now uh, I would like to welcome, uh, I must add, my friends and uh, uh, John and Charlotte Stores. Uh, they are the relatives of uh, 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 Sir Ronald Stores, but uh, I have to say that uh, how I met uh, the Stores family. I uh, curated uh, 10 years ago an exhibition in Eretz Israel Museum about, uh, about uh, Ronald Storrs. And uh, this, uh, in, all during the preparation of the exhibition, we couldn't find uh, any uh, connection to the family. Uh, we wrote many stores all over the world. They answered to us, uh, oh, if you find, if we have some connection, please let us know and nothing uh, because the uh, Ronald Stores had no children. And uh, after opening the exhibition, uh, we got an email from John Stores 
And he said, uh, I am uh, the relative, the nephew of uh, one of the stores, but uh, how they found about uh, the exhibition and uh, all about the research that happened in here, because here one of the stores is a very important person. Everyone knows uh, about him. And, um, and he said, uh, my wife, uh, she is a potter. And she was looking for, uh, in the internet, uh, pottery and uh, ceramics and stores uh, to see some publication about her. And then she found out that just uh, a few weeks uh, before there was an exhibition uh, opening in uh, uh, Tel Aviv. And since then, uh, of course, uh, we know each other and uh, they are very kind to host us in their house and to say about, you have to unmute or maybe uh, yourself. We've done that. Yes, and uh, we will start, uh, John, we'll start with you because uh, you can uh, tell us uh, about the family, but not really about your uncle because you never met him, I believe. Um, well, yes, that's true. I'm Australian. I'm from an Australian branch because my, my father, Ronald's brother, um, emigrated from the UK to Australia. He was a clergyman and um, he, he met my, my mother, my Australian mother there and became Bishop of Grafton out there and uh, uh, eventually retired and brought us back. Um, in 1959 uh, and Ronald died in 1955 so I never met him uh, there was a, a minimal amount of of communication with me as a as a young person um, a, a very rare birthday present I seem to remember what, what do you know the, the family uh, uh, your grandfather was uh, a church. Uh, he was he was vicar of was vicar. Uh, St Peter's Eaton Square, uh, which is a um, a, a well-known church in London, uh, and subsequently became dean of Rochester. Um, uh, uh, so, um, what else and can I say? Weekends? Yeah, I, what we see here now is the altar in St. Peter in uh, uh, Eton Square. It, it, this is uh, something that your grandfather was actually the patron. So the, the arts and the, your family there knows a, a lot about art, about uh, music. Uh, th this is the atmosphere that Ronald Storrs uh, got his uh, education in Pembroke College. Uh, this is also a connection to your family. Yes, well, <clears throat> um, uh, Ronald went to Pembroke. I think his father may have done that, but I'm not sure of that. Um, my father went to Pembroke. I went to Pembroke. So there's a fairly strong family connection with Pembroke College, Cambridge, that is. And then uh, after finishing uh, the college, he went uh, to the uh, British administration, to the foreign office in Egypt. And uh, he, from, you know, he became a, a, a very high uh, position in, in the administration also during the First World War. And uh, in Egypt, I think he got uh, all his idea about uh, conservation, about heritage. He, he established the Coptic uh, Museum in Cairo. And that was a very uh, important uh, time for him that actually said later that prepared him for uh, Jerusalem. And here we see him, uh, two years he was the a military uh, governor of uh, Jerusalem and uh, after two years in uh, 1920, exactly 100 years ago, he became the civil governor of uh, Jerusalem and part of it also in the uh, uh, Jaffa Tel Aviv area. And here we can see, this is from his private uh, album, we can see from his window uh, in uh, not far from here, uh, from the uh, 
his office. Uh, we can see uh, Jerusalem in the snow of uh, 1919, which was very heavy snow. But I want to come with you, John, to this uh, uh, special photo. Uh, we found it in uh, its uh, uh, newspaper clip uh, that uh, tell us about the place that actually is 100 meters from me now. It's St. George Cathedral. Uh, that was the parish uh, church of the Anglican or, or the British administration during the Mandate time. And uh, in the early 20s, Ronald Storrs devoted uh, the chapel, uh, St. John Chapel, uh, with Armenian ceramic, but totally not Armenian uh, style. This is uh, St. John's uh, cross. And uh, you can see he devoted it to who are the, those uh, people, your relatives? Sorry, who are the relatives? Well, Harry Cust, of course, is one of them. And <coughs> Ronald's brother, Francis. Now, Ronald's brother, Francis, I was telling near it yesterday, um, died um, in the Spanish flu influenza in 1918. Um, and it's very, very current, isn't it? Coronavirus and the flu uh, are much the same problem, though many more people died then than are dying now, I believe. It was a very traumatic uh, event, the Spanish. Also, uh, his best friend, Sir uh, uh, Mark Sykes, died from uh, the, the Spanish flu. And uh, it was such a shock after the First World War, but uh, later uh, so many people, even more people died in, in the plague than uh, in the war. And this uh, chapel doesn't, don't, don't look like that anymore. It looks uh, uh, many, many years ago, uh, someone just took away the, the tiles and now uh, the walls are uh, the stone walls. So uh, this uh, newspaper clip that we found together a few, some years ago, uh, show us how, uh, so you still have property in Jerusalem, not far from here in the St. George Cathedral. So we hope after the Corona you will come again and uh, we're going to see it uh, again. And um, here is uh, your brother, Michael Storrs, that came uh, 10 years ago to the exhibition. And uh, in the Balian uh, workshop, uh, and is with the painters. You are all artists in the family, I must say. Uh, that uh, um, I already said that uh, Ronald Storrs made the iconography of Jerusalem in the new era. So uh, it was not, in, uh, an artist, but he made uh, How Jerusalem Makes Today. And maybe to complete this uh, tour in history about Ronald Storrs, here we see Michael again visiting Jerusalem uh, 10 years ago. And uh, there was a scandal because in the end of the mandate uh, time, there was a, a street in uh, the center of Jerusalem uh, that was named by uh, Ronald Storrs. Uh, it was Store Street. And uh, later on, uh, because the uh, Zionists uh, didn't like stores very much, we have to say he didn't like them very much. Uh, and uh, after the establishment of the State of Israel, uh, the municipality said, uh, why uh, Store Street? It's not, uh, by the way, you can see above on, on the left side, you can see how this street uh, looks in the late uh, 40s, before uh, 48, it was Bevingrad, the closed uh, military and administration, the, uh, the British administration area that was closed. You can see it's like a war zoom. And, and uh, another thing, in, uh, during the war in 48, you can see uh, below uh, how this uh, uh, stores street looks like. So the, the tragic being, you know, trying, uh, beginning with the Pro Jerusalem Society, with the vision that uh, all the three religions uh, will gather together in the sake of uh, loving Jerusalem and forget to hate each other. Uh, so uh, during the 30 years of the um, uh, British mandate, uh, everything uh, fall apart. And uh, uh, later the name was changed after uh, 48, 
to Cyrus Street uh, because it was uh, like a bar for, you know, the one who gave the uh, declaration, um, the ancient uh, Persian king. And uh, now there is uh, uh, some kind of movement in Jerusalem bring stores again to the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, that this, uh, uh, it was in the newspaper when we made the, the exhibition uh, 10 years ago about Ronald Stores, but maybe uh, Jerusalem will uh, thank the, the person that uh, really shaped the landscape of uh, this uh, city. And um, uh, now uh, we will uh, go to uh, my colleague uh, Lena Dubinsky from Bezalel. Uh, please, uh, Lena, uh, we are going to uh, host uh, now or to be a guest of uh, Charlotte Stores uh, in uh, her workshop uh, in uh, Oxford. Please. Hi, Charlotte. Hi everybody. Hi. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to see your workshop and maybe uh, after this uh, I would ask I you first? a little bit about your process. Right, shall I do that first? Yes? Yeah. Shall, okay, yeah. let me just unplug that. Um, and I just need to work out how to turn this thing around. Oh, yep. Yeah. Hang on. Uh, I would suggest everyone to be here uh, now on the speaker view. But how does this... Um, your hand a bit. I'm, I'm trying to work this one out. Nirit, we not hear. We don't hear you. You can't. Okay, now we can see you. Yeah, and I can't can see your fingers. <laughs> but okay. I can't see me. So, oh yes, I've got me. Sorry. Yep, I'm getting there. I suggest uh, uh, to um, end sharing. Oh, I think. Sorry. I just no, need no, a larger, larger to picture. The... Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very small and I can't see very well. But anyway, um, I'm just going to tell you a bit about the pottery and it's a completely different thing from Neshan's beautiful ceramics and large workshop. I've got this rather small place in the corner of our garden. And as you might see, but I'll go around, um, all, everything I do is white. Um, so nothing of the beautiful, colorful, Armenian ceramics of Nashan's work. Uh, I will just go around. Now here is sort of a large plate and I use surface decoration. I will show you some rollers later. Um, actually, they will just show you the wheel. Uh, so my passion is really being on the wheel. I love throwing on the wheel. This place, my pottery is in the corner of our garden. It's a very peaceful place to work from. Um, and working on a wheel is a bit like magic. You have a lump of clay and you can turn it into something useful. So what I do is mainly functional stone where I don't do hand building, I don't do art, I just make things which can be used on a daily basis like plates, bowls, salad bowls, there are lots of things there. Um, can you see the, uh, our garden is fabulous, so a bit of flowers from the garden, you might be, I'll do a little tour through the garden in a minute. Uh, so there we are, there's again sort of surface decoration and I'll show you my rollers that I use. They're, they're here. And I made those um, just from clay using a scalpel and patiently cutting out and then firing them. So that's what I use when the clay is leather hard. When the clay is leather hard, that means that it's the day after it's thrown um, that you can use these rollers on the clay. So here we are, you know, just very practical stuff white coffee cups, egg cups, uh, fruit bowl, um, tagine. Anyway, and so it goes on. But one of the things that I love using is Akibia quinata. And here you see a, uh, a coil of Akibia. 
I get this uh, from Japan. In fact, I fell in love with this when we visited Japan. Um, I visited a lot of potters at that time. And uh, the first one I saw in Kyoto had this akibia handles, you know, teapots. Perhaps you can imagine teapots, Japanese teapots with akibia handles. And it's absolutely beautiful, very natural stuff. So um, that particular potter handed me a, a coil of akibia straight away. He could see, although there was no communication going on, my Japanese is non-existent and his English wasn't good either. So he gave me a coil and I took that home. There was another potter who showed me a supplier of um, akibia in Seto. I tried the akibia from uh, the Oxford Botanic Garden because that seems the obvious thing rather than getting something from the other, other side of the world. But that just doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't, isn't as pliable as this variety. So what happens is when I get this, I, uh, I soak it in water for two days and then it's very pliable. So it's a very natural <coughs> looking material. So lots of handles, there's a cheese tray. Again, surface decoration, a kibia handle, <coughs> there's more. I just like using that stuff and it goes very well with white. Now, I just have to say that what um, white might be very boring for a lot of people, thank goodness, um, not all. So uh, there are people who like white. For me, food is the most important, and not the plate that it's sitting on or the bowl that it's sitting on. So um, it works well for some and it's very calming. It's very peaceful. Um, I do a lot of dinner sets there's a i do three varieties of dinner sets that's one it's this very very plain white simple so all wheel thrown um there's other ones uh other ones with a certain amount of surface decoration then the other thing i'm going to show you is because i love making large pieces and um particularly in this time of corona i want to do a, a sort of back to nature range and I've been throwing these large bowls, which are, well, they're bird baths. I want to do really um, things to do with nature, whether it's vegetables, flowers, birds. Um, so I'm doing bird feeders, but these bird baths are sort of, I've thrown them 50 centimeters diameter. They're pretty large. Uh, it's a pretty good workout, I can tell you, to center that amount of clay. And the um, difficulty in glazing this will be explained in a minute because I use a vacuum glazing machine to glaze it because it's otherwise impossible to glaze these kind of large things. Um, and I had a time that I really wanted to make large pieces, but I had no idea how to glaze them. And I mentioned this to John and he immediately came out, but oh, I'll invent or I'll make you a vacuum glazing system. So he did and it works a treat. So that's that will be shown so, in a minute in a little clip. Yeah. And then there's so my, maybe we will show it. Uh, uh, maybe we can show it uh, now if you now. mention yeah. it. Yeah. Good. Yep. yep. Okay. So there's a large pot going on a rubber ring. That's a holder. I put the vacuum pump on, and it holds this large pot. And I now put it in the glaze. I usually count, so it, it goes slowly in, in my large bucket of glaze. Um, I usually count to six to really give it a good soaking, as it were. And then um, it's taken out, and I have to let it drip, as it were. But I can turn it upside down, and it won't fall off. So it's pretty miraculous. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. It made my life very, very easy like that. So I can now do really large pieces, which is just great fun to do. So there we are, one done. And the one which you see in front of that one will be done in the same way. Um, so, uh, Charlotte, what yes. the, can I ask you if what the most dominant concern in your process? Is it the interaction with the material, the material formation process, or is it the functional consideration of the final um, piece? Uh, well, I'm just a very practical person. It's practical design. I love designing things, so I come up with new things. Or friends might suggest something a day. Why don't you make this or that? Like uh, a friend not so long ago said, why don't you do fermenting a waterlogged fermenting pot so that you can make your own sauerkraut 
and fermenting vegetables. So I'm doing that now, and that seems to go pretty well. People are into doing that sort of thing, fermenting. So uh, other people suggest things, or I dream up things. And uh, that design work I find really interesting. I use a very groggy clay, very rustic, slightly rough clay. Um, again, it suits me. Uh, right, so it's design and, and practical. Uh, anything is practical. Yeah, and um, Charlotte, you're uh, originate from uh, Netherlands, right? I, I am. Yes, I'm very Dutch. Yeah, because <laughs> probably see you a present few Euro flags here. Yes, <laughs> but I can, I can also see this in your approach because you present an approach that defines the objects through a functional qualities and usefulness and effectiveness. And for me, it's fascinating to see in your work the combination of the Dutch lean and intrinsic approach to the design and functional wear with elements from Asia, the handles that uh, reflect yes. the idea and symbols of traditional craft from there. Yes. And so I, um, I wanted to, uh, um, maybe to, sh uh, uh, to show a few images um about our um, um our team here like yeah. these two material like in your work also material cultures combined they are calling the great historical role of ceramics in a cross cultural exchange around the globe and i feel that today we are telling the story yeah. of immigrants that redefine the visual paradigm in, in the new environment. Right, Nerit? I think we are... Uh, we're not here. Uh, are don't you know. sharing your... Uh... Yeah, so I, I want uh, to also to talk about the role of ceramics as a transfer medium in the global material culture. And I will show a uh, few images. Um, Concern this. Can can you see it? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, <coughs> okay. So, if I may, um, so the uh, the ceramic as a transfer medium in global material culture, uh, we should start from uh, the China. Um, since the 14th century, cobalt ore was shipped from Persia to China where it was used to decorate the famous blue and white porcelain that was uh, with the Middle Eastern market in mind, this plate, uh, because of the size, it's a very large size when it uh, uh, suggests um, communal meals that um, uh, suited Middle Eastern and Indian eating customs. And and this made the in a clay mold and integrating two decorative techniques of molding and painting in one white and uh, here we can see the persian uh, potters copied the blue and white uh, motifs in uh, their work um, and the rising demand for blue and white porcelain from europe aristocrats caused the dutch initiative for large scale import of porcelain from Asia. So the Netherlands was a center of import and uh, uh, we can see it uh, through the paintings, uh, the kitchen wares, the local pottery or kitchen wares that are simple in shapes and the, the guest appearance of Asian blue and white import. You notice the economical and effective functional shapes of Dutch pottery also in in uh, the Flemish painting uh, of this kind. And, and another uh, uh, reflection of Dutch tradition is in production of uh, Tichler Macom pottery. Um, that really, as you showed Charlotte, there's a uh, useful um, functional pieces yeah. and here, it's a demand, it's a reflection or answer to the demand of blue and white ceramics mm -hmm. from China. And mm -hmm. when they uh, merging the Chinese motifs and the context of a sea vessel that brought uh, the uh, blue and white porcelain to Europe. So alongside the, 
the imports, we can see the raise and rapid growth of the Delft industry uh, to meet the demand, to meet the demand for blue, uh, blue and white ceramics. And at the end of 15th century, we, uh, they were produced three, uh, 300,000 pieces of blue and white ceramics that include Asian motifs and European and Muslim Islamic uh, uh, motifs from Mediterranean ba uh, basin, as this is uh, made in Delft with the merge of uh, all kinds of patterns. Um, and here uh, again, the Tichler Makum. Um, cultural formation and adaptation of visual symbols and the ideas from China and from, um, and from Middle East. And uh, here a little bit more okay. colors involved. And the similar process can be recognized in Iznik, Iznik Chaini. Uh, we call uh, the, this is the example of remarkable story of Chinese motif of wine scroll that migrate from China, this is uh, from China, to Islamic countries, to Iznik, um, being integrated outside and despite the context of wine. And, uh, and you, we see the same motifs coming back in uh, another Iznik uh, plate. And the uh, Iznik potters worked in 17th century from originals and copied themes and patterns and shapes of Chinese porcelain from different pe uh, period. And this is integration of the theme of wine scroll in the tiles of mosque with deeply carved pattern of lattice formed by a pair of wine scrolls. And merging the Chinese motifs on the border of uh, this, uh, the, this dish with local uh, motifs. So I, I feel like today we are talking about the ceramics as material of transference uh, in visual geographies and what is arguably the first global culture. And also we're telling the stories of immigration of people, um, ideas, materials, and patterns. Thank you so much, uh, Lena, and uh, to John and Charlotte uh, stores. Uh, and uh, we are going back uh, to Jerusalem. Who said there are no flights anymore? Uh, we <laughs> went very, very uh, fast and very colorful. And, and uh, now we are going uh, to go back to the history, and we will end with uh, this. Uh, a historical, uh, just a moment, let's see this. And uh, we are going to the story of the uh, Balian family uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And please, uh, now uh, Nishan is uh, keeping the two majors for me yes, yes. <laughs> oh, okay start with my grandfather Nishan and Takuhi Balian where do I do the next over here Just... okay so that's my uh, <laughs> grandfather with the violin and Magadich Karakashian mm -hmm. with the wood uh, on the far left having a good time after a hard day's work uh, at the studio. And I want to get into the frame. Yes. You can give it, you can see us uh, maybe a, a little, or maybe I will just uh, enlarge it for a second. Uh, oh, okay. I, I hope that you can see us. Uh, I brought some surprise because you see the wood that Megadish uh, Torakashian is holding. Your grandfather uh, holding the violin. My grandfather holding the violin. Yes. And uh, what that, uh, we can see here, I brought it from home. Yeah. Uh, that was belonged to uh, my uh, my husband's grandfather, Shukri uh, Khalifa. They came in the 19th century to Jerusalem, and they were also a musician. And we have it in the family. This wood was. 
uh, were, was born in the uh, 20s, the same uh, time, exactly the same uh, pattern, and inside it's written that it's uh, made by a workshop of woods and, and the musical, uh, musical instruments of Armenian uh, workshops. So also the music, so uh, exactly from... That's a nice, that's a nice surprise. Yes. <laughs> okay, my great grandmother on the right, that is in uh, Tahia. The whole family was into ceramics, basically. Uh, we are back to that image. Let me see. Are we going back? Or no, yes. ah, this is the Hebrew version. So, okay. The National Geographic magazine, 1927. There was an article about the Armenian ceramics. Uh, so we were in that. The three families, Balian, Karakashiano, and Nesian, with a nice picture. Yes, uh, I went to the National Geographic in Washington to get the actual copies. I have three, four copies from the Library of Congress. And so my grandfather uh, throwing on the wheel in Kutakian, Nisham Balian. Uh, my grandfather in Jerusalem. As the father. Yes, a family of potters. Yes. A family of potters, although both my father and mother, they were good in design also. That's my father, and the, the right is uh, his sister, as people passed away uh, at a young age. That's my father, uh, fifth from the left. Uh, he was a, a very excellent uh, soccer player. Uh, I actually got to work easily in banks because of his soccer talent. The Barclays Bank, the IPC Iraq, the Iraqi Petroleum Company, he worked in all of these because he was good in uh, soccer. That is his king in Lebanon, in the mountains of Lebanon. Close to a lion in the Cairo Zoo, which uh, maybe it will later explain about the story. Uh, uh, very shortly, because uh, when we find uh, every Israeli knows the first uh, monuments uh, uh, in the art history of, uh, of uh, uh, Israel, and uh, that was Tel Chai in, in the Up Galilee. And uh, there is a monument by the uh, Assyrian uh, lion, the Assyrian style uh, lion, was made by uh, the sculptor, uh, sculptor uh, um, Abraham Melnikov. And he was uh, trying to find a model to be the lion in the 30s. And he went to the Giza Zoo in Cairo, uh, was looking at the, the lion for hours until the lion was uh, quite upset from these uh, things and this gave uh, Melnikov uh, a very big uh, scratch in, in his uh, uh, chest and, and then uh, he almost died of that and uh, in your family album we find from almost the same period uh, so in Israel, it's very dramatic news to find the, the modelist, uh, the, the lion, movie. yes uh, okay. That's okay, uh, my parents getting married. This is at the entrance to the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, 1954. Uh, family picture to all together uh, in the Church of the Nativity. Uh, my parents getting married. My uncle Lago working. The, the baptism of my younger brother, Rohan, who was a doctor now. In, a doctor of economics in uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, and then my mother, uh, with, with uh, Silva, my uh, sister. This was in a, by the refugee camp in Amman. We were so poor by then, you know. The, my father had left uh, Jerusalem and started his own business. And it was very difficult. He convinced. He was a good ceramist. He convinced. Uh, six uh, individuals, uh, wealthy individuals to do in Amman, to start the, the industrial factory in Amman. And this, these were in the beginning days, very tough for us. I remember, uh, when I, I was very young, but I remember some of the neighborhood. That's myself uh, on the right and my brother on the left, Ohan. 
my father carrying the board of us and then a friend also to the far right. The family in France, we had a France connection because my grandmother, uh, this is in Lyon, my grandmother lived in Destin, which is very close to Lyon. So every summer, almost every summer, we used to go to Lyon to see my grandmother. So that is the French connection over there. My parents standing in front of our house in Beit Hanina in East Jerusalem. This is the house that they built. It was a huge house, three, four levels, which we later had to sell. It was too large. Uh, an old picture of my grandfather on the far left, Nisham Balian, and my father, Setrak Balian, uh, doing the pottery together. They, they, they had a difficult relationship together because uh, my grandfather wanted consistency and he was very picky when my father couldn't do exact sizes. So basically my father left uh, because he couldn't get along until 1964. He set up his uh, studio, uh, industrial ceramics, very successful industrial ceramics in Amman, Jordan. And then in 64, 63, when my grandfather passed away, they, he came back to Jerusalem. That's a story for a book, which I like. Uh, this is the factory in Amman, Jordan, producing uh, bricks from clay. Basically, he started from zero. He built all the kilns. He found the clay in Jordan. Uh, he did the tests. Uh, there was no internet. There was no uh, fax machine. He did everything from scratch, from his experience from England. All the machines, uh, most of them were built in Jordan. Teaching uh, people how to throw on the wheel, the second from right, my father. I think that is in uh, Amman, Jordan, not in Jerusalem, if I'm not mistaken. Abed Rashid, uh, our main potter, when my father was busy running the factory, he, he grew up with my grandfather he, and he passed away in our studio. On the left, you'll see my brother with Abed Rashid. He was, Abed Rashid was part of the family. Uh, his two children uh, work with us now. And then, that's him. And then we have my King Hussein congratulating my father with a diploma uh, for the first ceramics factory uh, producing bricks and clay pipes and roof tiles in Amman, Jordan. And my father explaining to King Hussein the production that you see on your right, the clay pipes on the bottom. They really used, there was no plastics then, and all the sewage and electrical lines were done in ceramic clay pipes. So that was the good era. We, my, we made a lot of good money over there, sending to Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Uh, my father, somewhere in the picture over here, standing with the uh, Armenian Catholicos of Armenia and the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem, Yerushad Adonai on the right, and King Hussein in the middle. He, he used to represent the Armenian community in Amman and Jerusalem. Uh, in, in front of the uh, room where, where the girls used to paint, and a big sign in private, you can see the Hebrew added later on, so that people couldn't come and see how the, the the tricks uh, of uh, transferring designs to plates and vases were done. So there was a, a sort of a secret uh, room over there because we, we were competing then by then the Hebron potters who were famous for the glass industry started imitating the Armenian ceramics and mass producing that. Uh, so we can try to keep these secrets eventually to work. Uh, my father in the showroom, my mother, in her painting studio, you can see she's wearing black. That is after my father passed away in 1996. So supervising the girls, the painters in the studio, under this decoration. So the girls painting videos. That's again my mother, showroom. Painting one of her large murals, direct painting of the screen, or anything like that. Uh, the exhibition at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. at the Dylan Gallery, Views of Paradise, 1992. 
in front of one of our large neurons. Really fantastic achievement to uh, make possible by Dr. West and Laura and Dick. I should mention them. In the corridor of the studio where you see now a lot of her ceramic type neurons. The showroom in the 1997. Production facilities. The raw clay, etc., etc. By the way, we bring our clay usually from Italy or England because in Israel you don't have good white clay. I'm trying to work out that we can do some of the local clay. It's not the, 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 yes. the, the only thing is in Jerusalem, everything ourselves is uh, it's unique about us. My mom, uh, this is an interesting uh, picture where she's sit screening the black outline. She learned this from Arta Tel Aviv. Arta is a, was a shop where you could buy uh, graphic uh, supplies. Uh, and she learned uh, the silk screening technique. And uh, we did this at home because she, she was afraid that the workers, the part-time workers, they would learn this technique and start imitating us and doing it. So she used to sit screen at home. I remember that distinctly. And, Take the tiles, basically it was only for the ceramic tiles, the sit skinny, the black outline, and then the girls used to uh, uh, fill in the colors. And I used to carry the in the car the tiles to the studios. And eventually I made everything in the studio, the skinny process. And uh, painting uh, one of her large murals. The facade of the studio, the Palestinian pottery, which we changed to the ceramic facade. Uh, you know. And the book, uh, Nurit Kalan Kedar and uh, Nurit uh, Kalev, we made it together. The left one is the Hebrew version uh, with a, a cover of the Kakashian ceramics, and the right is the English version with one of the copies, uh, coming from one of the copies of my mom's Hebrew. So that's about it. Yes, and, um, we'll stop here. And uh, I would like to thank uh, really everyone that joined us uh, in uh, England and uh, in Israel and in Jerusalem and maybe other parts of uh, the world. Uh, uh, and uh, to remind you, if uh, you can still write uh, your email address in the chat, because during this weekend, uh, if you're going to register, some of the, some of you already did it. Uh, you'll get also the outdoor, uh, um, uh, the exhibition trail of the Armenian ceramic in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, now it's online, but uh, very soon we hope uh, that you will be able to come back and to see. And also the film by Professor uh, Yael Katsir. Uh, that uh, is uh, will be open uh, during this uh, weekend here and in Europe uh, until uh, Monday morning, so you can uh, uh, get uh, uh, the permission to uh, see uh, this uh, uh, wonderful film about the uh, glimpse of paradise by Marie Balian and uh, show you all uh, the work of this. Uh, uh, amazing uh, and so important uh, artist in the history of uh, Jerusalem and the uh, work of uh, Professor Nurit Knan Kedar that actually established the research about the uh, Armenian ceramic of Jerusalem as a unique art school of uh, Jerusalem. We are all the time, you know, by influence of other art school, but uh, this is something that the Armenian community the refugees from the Armenian genocide brought to this uh, city and make a glimpse of paradise uh, on the stones of Jerusalem. So I would like to thank uh, to uh, Lena Dubinsky from Bezalel, from uh, to Nishan Balian that host us here. Can I just say one word? Yes, of course. Can I just uh, say that I'm probably going to be followed by my three children, uh, who I often forget to mention. Uh, my elder son, Keram, who is uh, works with me, my uh, daughter, uh, Nanor, who is trapped in Madrid, uh, but she's well, and she, she wants to come back and take over the management. My son, Cedrak, uh, who is in Armenia, and together maybe we'll set up over there the studio for the uh, Armenian ceramics. Uh, 
it's a joke, but the Armenian ceramics of Jerusalem is an identity of Jerusalem. If you go to Armenia, you won't be able to find anything similar like that. So we're slowly introducing that. So hopefully we have a fourth generation coming and continuing the Armenian, the Balian ceramics of Jerusalem. Thank and you very much for my audience. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go Yes, and you can visit, of course, the site in this uh, catalog that you get uh, by email. Uh, you can also uh, visit in the... Uh, our website, armeniaceramics.com. It's not free advertising, but it's an interesting site where you can uh, learn more about the history. Thank you very much. Yes, so, thank you everything. All uh, the Advent V team, uh, LRL, uh, and uh, Dina Roth, uh, Dana Lanzman that uh, join us. Uh, to make this uh, uh, meeting, uh, Judith, uh, of course, and uh, maybe early, uh, if uh, people are leaving now, maybe we can just show them, they can stay uh, a little longer to see a very uh, short uh, uh, clip about the painters of the, uh, of the workshop. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you soon in uh, our meetings. Thank Good you. evening. Thank you.